Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled Toward Personalized Total Knee Arthroplasty, Pre-Planning the Patient's Optimal Joint Function in Robotic Assisted Surgery. My name is Christopher Iverson, and I work here at Anybody Technology. And today I will be the host of this webinar, and during the Q&A session in the end, I will be joined by my colleague Bjorn England, who is one of our research and development engineers here at Anybody. In today's webcast, we have an external speaker, Periklis Tanitis, who is actually a postdoc now. He was a PhD candidate when I wrote this slide. So now he's a postdoc from the University of Trinde in the Netherlands. And Periklis will present a novel pre-operative planning tool based on musculoskeletal modeling that aims to assist orthopedic surgeons in reconstructing the functional state of the native knee through robotic assisted total knee arthroplasty. And this presentation will start in a few minutes or so. But just before we go ahead and start the presentation, I will give a general introduction and overview of the antibody modeling system. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the software or musculoskeletal modeling and simulations in general. And I would like to point your attention that you have to be aware that this presentation is the first in a series of webinars on this topic. And if you really want the full story, then you can visit or revisit the first two webinars through our website where we have uploaded the recordings along with Perictus presentations. The presentation today was first presented at the annual meeting of the International Society of Technology and Arthroplasty last month in New York. And at, at this conference, Perictus was awarded the Early Career Investigator Award for his work. I would also like to point your attention to the control panel, which appears on the right side of your screen. And you are more than welcome to submit questions and comments via the questions panel during the presentation. We will try to do our best to address these questions in the very end of the webinar. And in case we do not get to answer all of your questions, then we'll try to do so by email within reasonable time. But let's begin with have a look at what, what the Anybody Modeling System actually is. So the Anybody Modeling System is a software that allows you to do musculoskeletal modeling and simulations. As input, it takes motion data as kinematics and forces, and it calculates the internal body loads as joint moments, joint reaction forces, and muscle forces. And this is a screenshot from the actual software, so this can give you an idea of how the system looks. At the moment, anybody is used in a wide variety of areas and applications, and a few examples of this is movement analysis, product optimization design, the field of sports optimization, ergonomics, orthopedics and rehabilitation, and assistive devices as, for example, an exoskeleton. And the typical workflow in anybody could look something like this. So you provide the recorded motion data as input, and then you use the body models, which comes with the repository, with, or you build yourself. And then you can provide some kind of environment, which could be, for example, a special type of equipment or an exoskeleton, but it could also be something as simple as the ground. You can then go ahead and use anybody to combine these things and solve the muscle recruitment and run the inverse dynamic simulations. And this basically means that we go from motion to calculate the internal body loads and the interaction with the environment in some cases. We can then go ahead and output the results and use it for some kind of post-processing, which for example could be with a finite element tool. But many users also choose to complete this loop and do some kind of design optimization, and then run this cycle multiple times. And this actually brings me to the end of the introduction, and I'll hand over the word and present the role to Perictis instead. For, for uh, the introduction, it's absolutely a great pleasure to speak in this third series, indeed, of um, Anybody Webcast. Um, the title of this presentation is um, Toward Personalized Total Knee Arthroplasty, Pre-Planning the Patient's Optimal Joint Function in Robotic-Assisted Surgery. And this is my disclosure. Well, technology in total knee arthroplasty has progressed over the years from uh, the manual intervention to knee navigation and the use of personalized surgical um, instrumentation all the way to robotics and robotic assisted surgery. And specifically robotic assisted total knee arthroplasty has been shown to offer a high degree of accuracy and precision to the plan when compared to manual techniques. But Apart from precisely cutting the bones or achieving the desired placement of the knee implant, 
there remains to determine the target of these versatile instruments that will also lead to clinical improvement. Traditionally, the knee implants are placed according to mechanical alignment principles because it is a technique that could be performed with traditional imaging and conventional surgical instruments, ultimately striving for a straight leg. Uh, we discussed in that in a previous webcast. However, we know that a certain fraction of the normal population does not have a neutral limb alignment at the end of skeletal growth, but rather some degree of varus or uh, valgus. If you look at, uh, at the hip knee ankle angle in a cohort, in this cohort of healthy knees. So this consecutively means that restoring mechanical alignment in this particular patients would be unnatural for them because in fact, it would implicate an overcorrection of their natural situation. And consequently, it is not surprising that even with utilizing a robotic system, the clinical or functional benefits are small compared to the conventional total knee arthroplasty. And for this reason, there's currently a lively discussion in the field on implementing alternative alignment philosophies. For instance, the kinematic alignment or more recently, uh, the functional alignment toward a more personalized approach in positioning uh, the components. Now, from a biomechanical point of view, our hypothesis here is that restoring the healthy knee biomechanics in terms of ligament strains and knee kinematics is a logical and important target for, for alignment. And in this work, we focused on the knee joint. And if we scan the osteoarthritic knee, we could see that there are morphological changes to the bones due to the osteophytes. And the osteophytes could consecutively affect the biomechanics and ultimately our target, right? Hence, the question that arises here is whether we can indeed utilize the preoperative imaging or whether we should consider regenerating the pre-disease state of the knee bones without the osteophytes toward achieving our goal. Now, to answer this question, we utilized patient databases and AI algorithms, which enabled us first to detect the osteophytes in the scan and subsequently to identify the osteophyte-free subchondral surfaces. The run, we were able to reconstruct the osteoarthritic bones with the osteophytes, as well as regenerate the pre-diseased bones after removal of the osteophytes, as you see on, on, on the right. And by leveraging these renderings to morph the geometry of a musculoskeletal knee model, we perform a simulation analysis and we looked at the strains, so the strains of the ligaments and the kinematics comparing osteoarthritic knees with their corresponding pre-diseased counterparts in a cohort of 21 patients. And in fact, we found that the presence of osteophytes, for instance, posteriorly to the femur, as we see in this particular example, may have a relevant effect on the strains of the ligaments and the kinematics, of course, depending on their location and interference with their surrounding soft tissues. And therefore, it is important to regenerate the pre-diseased state if we indeed target the restoration of the pre-diseased by mechanical conditions. Now, building upon this information, we utilize the pre-diseased um, model and we place an implant to the model and we align the components according to mechanical alignment principles. So we, we first aim to identify the biomechanical differences between the pre-diseased and mechanically aligned knees. And our analysis here show that mechanically aligning the knee implants can induce relevant alterations to the ligament strains and the kinematics in relation to the pre-diseased state over the full range of motion. The subsequent goal here was therefore to minimize the differences that we identified toward reproducing the, the, the pre-diseased biomechanical situation. And for this purpose, we employed an optimization algorithm which strived to optimize the placement of the implant starting from mechanical alignment such that the pre strains and kinematics are respected as much as possible. And here by an example from a single patient um, on the right, which shows the progression of the uh, optimization function of our routine, uh, starting from one, that is the mechanical alignment position, until it finds an optimal solution that indeed provides the minimal difference in ligament strains and kinematics between the implanted and pre-diseased model. And 
ultimately, these positional adjustments allowed for uh, a pre-diseased and shape-driven alignment over the range of motion. And of course, this sounds a very simple procedure, uh, right? And as there is only one solution, but if we look more carefully, we could actually see that there are a number of solutions in the placement of the implant, which seem to be more effective than mechanical alignment. Uh, so if you look at this figure, the red point is mechanical alignment. So our starting point, our reference, the gray one is far away from the predecessor state, which is actually our target. While the blue point is the closest to the predeceased uh, state. Now, what type of positional deviations do we find from mechanical alignment if we apply this approach to the population of 21 patients, as mentioned earlier? Well, it seems that some patients are okay with mechanical alignment, but other patients require substantial positional adjustments. And with this method, indeed, we can determine what kind of adjustments are required, how large are uh, these adjustments, and um, keep our hypothesis, our initial hypothesis in, uh, in mind. And overall, with this method, we could contribute to the preoperative planning of robotic assisted total knee arthroplasty, providing information and adaptive plan, which could possibly serve as a new position for subsequent functional alignment. And this consecutively means that the surgeons remain in the loop and they can interoperatively assess whether the proposed position meets their expectations. Accordingly, they can make adjustments intraoperatively, assessing also the, the laxity profiling, right? Uh, before fitting the alignment target to the robot for its precise execution. To conclude with, I should also emphasize that in this work, in this particular work, we only looked at the biomechanical aspects of the knee, including the strains and the kinematics. And it is important to further improve this way of thinking, including also aspects that could be relevant from a clinical standpoint. Uh, for example, how well the implant uh, fits the bone after optimization, or um, what should be the clinically acceptable positional um, boundaries with respect to mechanical alignment, for example, to prevent impingement between the implant and the surrounding soft tissues. Uh, before closing this presentation, I would uh, like to highlight that uh, this work is, of course, the result of a team um, effort. So I would like to acknowledge my, uh, my colleagues at the University of Twente and uh, Stryker for their invaluable contribution in this uh, research work. I would like to thank you for, uh, for your attention and yeah, feel free to, to contact me if you have um, any questions. Thank you very much for the presentation, Pericles. I think it was a very great wrap up from the two previous webcasts you did. So just before we go to the Q&A session, I would just like to say a few words about our online resources. So I will just make myself the presenter once again. Yeah, so I would like to say that if you want to know more about Anybody Technology, then you can go and check out our website, anybodytech.com, where you can find different events, special dates, and it's also here our previous webcast, our thoughts. So we, there's a big library of all the webcasts we do, and you can go there and, and browse and filter it with your area and figure out if the, what has been done previously. Uh, we do also try to maintain a full publication list of studies using the Anybody Modeling System, and you will also find that on our website. So you can go there and select, for example, orthopedics, and then you get at least all of the papers that we know have been published using Anybody within orthopedics. You can also check out our community website. Uh, it's called anyscript.org, and it's, it's really relevant for people using anybody. So you can find multiple online resources as our wiki page, several blog posts, and also links to our repository sites. It's also here our forum is located, so you can go there and ask questions and get help from fellow anybody users. Then I would also like to announce our upcoming webcast in November. The date is not certain yet, but it will definitely be in November. And the title of this event is Effects of Gait Modifications on Tissue Level Knee Mechanics in Individuals with Medial Tibofemoral Osteoarthritis, a proof of concept study towards personalized interventions. 
and the registration for this was this webcast will open very soon but in the meantime you can go and read the article which is published already and it's open access I would also like to point your attention to the annual meeting of the Danish Society of Biomechanics, where you can go and meet us as well. So this will be the 24th of November in Aalborg, Denmark. So if you happen to be in the area or you're attending this conference, then make sure to stop by our booth there. Last but not least, if you have any questions or you just want to meet up or get a trial of our software, then please feel free to send us an email at sales at anybodytech.com. And if you have any follow-up questions regarding this webcast or any of the previous ones, then please feel free to send me an email at ki at anybodytech.com or reach out to me directly through LinkedIn. And this uh, brings me to the end of the presentation. So I would like to thank you for your attention so far, and I think it's time for questions now. So I would like to bring John on board. So you had time to look at the questions. So could you read the first one? Yeah. So hi Periklis and thank you for the presentation. So we have an interesting uh, question from the audience who would like to know a little more about under which conditions, loading conditions, the simulations were done. Uh, the person is stating that these subjects that you are in investigating often have injured ligaments. So did you by any chance uh, tune uh, the parameters of the ligaments in the process? Well, yeah, I would say that this question has two parts. So starting from the ligaments, um, well, it is always hard to, um, to, to personalize the ligaments. So in this particular work, um, we actually um, utilized ligament parameters, ligament mechanical properties um, from the literature, from previous uh, clinical studies. Um, but we are currently working toward uh, looking at this direction. And so we could fine-tune indeed uh, the, the ligament mechanical uh, properties so we could um, so we could also validate our uh, model uh, predictions um, and about the loading conditions so <clears throat> in this project in this uh, workflow we um, we tested only a knee extension mon motion um, and it was unloaded it is always difficult it, it, it was difficult to to know uh, the external forces applied to the model. So we decided to, um, to simulate an extension movement unloaded um, and only um, assisted by the gravity. Um, but in principle, we could test um, more, more movements. Eh? We have done this previously. If you also look at the previous um, webcast, but it is important to highlight here that uh, this particular movement um, it is also important for the intraoperative uh, procedure because it is typically uh, performed by the surgeon to uh, to assess the soft tissue uh, laxity, so ultimately they can achieve a balanced uh, knee motion. Thank you very much, Blake. That's a very good notion with the last thing you mentioned. Yeah, so let me just assign the next question to Rupriklis so you can read it as well. So we have one of the attendees who thank you for the presentation and is saying that uh, he imagined that you are using the FTK algorithm for the knee joint. And for those of you who don't know, that's force dependent kinematics, which is like a simulation method we have inside anybody. But could you could you talk a little bit about if you changed any of the parameters of the FTK input? Well, indeed, uh, we use the, uh, the the fourth band and kinematics um, approach. So the so the motion uh, is is actually controlled by the the forces exerted uh, by the by the soft tissue around uh, the ligaments also. But um, we did not um, adjust the, uh, the the parameters of the, of the FDK algorithm at all. Uh, so we actually relied on, uh, on the previous work uh, on the um, on the grand challenge of the fifth grand challenge uh, model uh, previously developed by Mark Amara here at the University of Twente. So um, based on that, we, we simulated um, our model. So to answer this question, yeah, we did not tune uh, the parameters of uh, FDK um, algorithm, I'm not sure which parameters um, um, does the um, the attendee mean? Maybe it could be more 
uh, specific, so it's easier for me to answer. Sure. So, so yeah. Please elaborate a bit on the question if you if you need a better answer or more elaborate answer. Um, at least I can say as well as we have a lot about a lot of documentation about the FTK method on our community website. So this what this any script.org. So you can go there and read about the FTK method as well. So I'll hand it over to you again, Bjorn. Could you read out the next one? Yeah. So the next uh, question, Briglis, is about if you if you after doing your study, if you looked at any of the uh, uh, alignment, if the, if if you could find any categories or patient characteristics that would sort of group the alignment that came out of your study. Yeah. Very very good question. Um, and a tricky one, I would say. Uh, well. We had, as I said, we had different patients. So we would like to see the, the patient specific characteristic. We would like to capture the patient specific um, characteristics. So <clears throat> we, we first uh, place the implant according to mechanical alignment, as I said. So all the patients had a straight uh, leg. So after optimization, um, we noticed, of course, that there were some trends in alignment. Uh, um, and soon uh, there will be a publication on that. So we observed indeed positioning trends, if that is a question, on aligning the, the, the components on this set of patients. But um, it is also important to acknowledge the limitations of, 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 this, um, of this work. Huh? So we utilized um, only one uh, implant type, so a cruciate retaining um, prosthesis, so we didn't see any other types of implants or, um, yeah, for, for instance, a medial pivot uh, could be a prosthesis according to the literature that could facilitate um, reproduction of the, the predeceased of the healthy situation, but we didn't look at it. So maybe by utilizing another prosthesis type, uh, we could observe different, um, different trends. So we would need to know we need to, to look further on that and we need to do further research and elucidate whether the positioning, the positional trends that we observed in this particular work persist when we adjust our algorithm or we adjust the parameters of, of the implant. Um, so yeah, again, there will be soon a publication on that uh, with, with more details. Thanks a lot, Rick. It's, it's for sure it's a very interesting question to, to see if, if doing a lot of these things will, will result in any groups, uh, or as you mentioned, maybe it can be paired with the, with the type of implant uh, if, you, if you extend. Um, maybe another question in this direction is, is about uh, your optimization routine. So um, can you maybe elaborate, did you, did you build your optimization routine in anybody uh, using the, the inbuilt methods and algorithms, or did you uh, extract data and then perform uh, your own uh, optimization routine outside of anybody? Yes, exactly. Uh, well, we did not use the uh, the building optimization routine in anybody, but anybody was actually one of the main components of our optimization, as you can imagine. Uh, so we built our own optimization, uh, but um, for running the models, uh, the optimization routine calls uh, the anybody software, so um, so it can simulate the model with different implant positions and compare the results. So we find the curves, the curvatures that uh, of the implanted case that best reproduce, uh, so as closely as possible, of course, uh, the predeceased by mechanical uh, situation. Yeah, thanks a lot, because maybe it is worth to note in this sense that, 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 as I mentioned, anybody has its own optimization studies that you can actually set up and do while you're working with the model. But, but a very strong uh, tool is also uh, the tool that you have been using, like uh, using our Python library, which wraps around exactly. uh, processing anybody. And then you can sort of have anybody as one component in a larger optimization workflow. So, so this is something that we really, uh, would like to, to brag a little about that, that you can actually take your normal data science tools and extend it with running anybody simulations. Yeah. Yeah, so 
I'm also a bit curious, Periklis. So you recently announced that you now have a postdoc position at the University of Trente. So are you continuing in the, in this field, or what's next for your research? If you know that already. Yes, I definitely continue this field, and yeah, part of uh, future research is actually um, improving this uh, this work because what's the ultimate target? Huh? So always the ultimate goal is to to produce something uh, that is useful and and ultimately apply to the clinical uh, practice, right? So something that can assist indeed the orthopedic surgeons in the operating uh, room. So we are currently working. To, um, to to accelerate this procedure, you can imagine there are a lot of blocks involved in this uh, process for, for from from segmentation, uh, from imaging and segmentation to modeling and optimization. And you can imagine that these are um, uh, time-consuming pro processes. So we are working towards um, this direction. Um, so we could um, simplify the process and reduce the manual effort required to um, to reconstruct the patient specific geometries um, build the patient specific models in the anybody software and ultimately find the optimal position of the of the implant so that can help uh, preoperatively the operating uh, surgeon so they can then decide whether this is okay or not perfect Thank you very much. So yeah, I'm looking forward to host like a fourth webinar with you and see what the yeah, future sure. will. Um, just of a more practical note, then uh, there's a few people asking about where they can get the presentation. So I already agreed with Periklis that we will upload the presentation on our website. So you can download it in a PDF format there. So you can have a, a closer look at, at the material shared. But I think we will end the presentation here. So thank you very much again for the presentation, Periklis. Thank you, too, Christopher. And thank you for all of the attendees listening in. So I hope to see you again in the future for another webinar. Thank you.